as we're nearing the end of our conference, full conference day, the panel titles seem to be getting longer. Uh, kids Do It Yourself Media Project, Opportunities and Challenges of Kids Creating and Sharing Media Online. And I think I came up with this title, so my fault. Um, uh, but kidding aside, this next session is a very special one. Uh, the Kids Do It Yourself Media Project is an extensive re research project that is now entering its second year, I believe, uh, led by Sarah Grimes of the University of Toronto and Deborah Fields of Utah State University. The project is an, a first attempt really to properly understand the phenomenon of children creating and sharing media online. Uh, you've seen all of the you know, videos of Minecraft um, on YouTube, for instance, with all of its implications both in terms of media literacy and question, questions surrounding the rights of privacy in the digital space of the internet. Um, Sarah and Deborah have invited uh, a wide array of partners to this project and TIFF is one of those partners. They'll be joined today by Jason Crow, uh, another partner in the project, CEO of Toronto-based app developer Sago Zago, and uh, Brian Altsbach of New York City-based uh, game publisher Eline Media. And the session will be moderated by Play Collective's uh, David Kleeman. And I can assure you, you're in good hands over the next hour. So over to you, David. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I just Since we're coming toward the end of the day, and as I've been sitting and waiting for this session and listening to what's been going on through the rest of the day, it's a really encouraging feeling to me to see the range of things that are that exist as children's media and children's and family media right now. I think you know, starting the day with the Leica presentation and seeing seeing the care that goes into that, seeing just the full range of, of things, and I think I think it's very important now that we're going to end the day or not end the day, but but you know, sort of come to this session to talk about what's being made by young people themselves, that, that this is one of the biggest developments we're seeing in, in the world of children and media right now, is, is that kids are taking over the tools of production, they are able to express themselves. I, at the same time, kids do it yourself is probably about as old as childhood. You, you sort of have this imagination that back at Lasco somewhere, there was a kid who picked up you know, the, the charcoal who picked up the rock and carved into the, the side of the wall and made, made his own cave painting. Um, and even, even if we talk about screen media, a lot of the earliest forms engaged kids as content creators. Uh, there was a, an American program way back in the early days of television called Winky Dink. And the idea of Winky Dink was you put a plastic sheet over your television set and then you had to draw and help, you had to participate in the show in order to help save the day. And the only problem with the program was that most kids didn't get the plastic sheet, they just drew on the television set, so that show didn't, didn't last long. But it, it was really a first attempt to engage kids in the content themselves. Make and do shows have been around and, you know, about as long as there's been children's television. But now as we enter the, the sort of still emerging very much mobile media era, DIY has taken on a whole new meaning and a whole new direction. The tools are out there for kids to have, have opportunities as never before for self-expression, outlets for their creativity, and means for sharing what, they, what they've made. And that opens, obviously, some amazing possibilities. They, um, the tools of production have never been more democratic and easy to use right now, that to the point where DIY can even reach down into the earliest years. Even toddlers are doing their own drawings using tablets, um, you know, are, are really uh, able to, to participate themselves. But at the same time, obviously, it triggers some warnings, too, that at what age and to what extent do kids really understand when they go to share what they've made, the implications of sharing and just how far something can reach. Um, how do they acquire understanding of ownership and, and copyright? Not just in terms of not infringing on others, but in terms of protecting their own their own creativity and what they've made. Um, as, uh, we also have to think about the adults in kids' lives, parents, but also content and, and platform creators. How do we best empower children to create, to invent, to collaborate, to share? And, and really help them without stepping on their toes at the same time and offering too much guidance or too many rules to the point where we, we kind of stifle their creativity. How do, how do we create comprehensive media literacy education from as early as possible and where's the best place to do that? At home, in school, or both? Self-expression is a human right under the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Good thing we're north of the border, so I can talk about that back, back home in the US. I don't get much chance to talk about the Convention on the Rights of the Child. <laughs> Um, but the convention was written at a time before we could really imagine what 
the impact of the internet and the, the would be and the two-edged sword that we've got now of global sharing and things that you put up digitally that never really are gone. We've got a fantastic panel today to, to discuss some of the ongoing issues um, in kids DIY, some of the best practice applications that uh, we have for enabling young people to make stories, to make art, to make games, and ways to make the experience of creating and sharing a really happy, enthusiastic, educational experience for them. Christoph has already done the kind of formal introductions of who everyone is and who they work for, so I'm, and that's all in your book, so I'm going to skip that. I'm just going to start by saying that I've been really pleased to be involved so far with Sarah and Debbie in, in the uh, the DIY project, to be able to listen to the experts in the field. And I think what they've done that's really remarkable, as they will now introduce the project, is bring together many different fields in one place. The academic research world, the industry research world, the, um, the world of content creators, the world of people who know how children grow and learn. And that, I think, is, is the way we need to go for research around children and media today, a really comprehensive and global approach to it. So with that, let me invite you to uh, introduce us to the project. Thank you so much, David. And that was such an amazing introduction of the project and kind of where where we came from in, in devising this project and what inspired us. Um, so as you all know, kids make media. And as David said, this is something that's really a core part of childhood and has been for you know, millennia. Um, the big difference uh, that we've uh, been noticing over the past uh, couple of decades is that increasingly kids are making media in digital formats and that means not only that they're able to make different types of media and increasingly diverse forms of media but also collaborative uh, types of media and, and collaborative for types of making as well as uh, the big huge change which is distributing this media to a potentially worldwide audience you know it's no longer something that's confined to a classroom setting or something you post on the refrigerator when you get home um, it's now something that kids are being are able to post on YouTube and, and post on scratch a number of different sites which opens up a variety of different implications Debbie and I come from different backgrounds, uh, academic backgrounds. Debbie's in education and uh, mine's in media and technology studies. And we're both really focused on the amazing opportunities and benefits that making media and kids' increasing participation in media making can have for kids in terms of their learning, in terms of skill development, in terms of their cultural and communications rights, as well as in terms of their well-being, their cultural experience, their, their uh, relationship with peers and their socialization and self-identity. Um, but we're also really fascinated and kind of concerned and, and interested in some of these implications that David mentioned uh, in terms of things not quite uh, being uh, caught up to the practices in terms of regulation, in terms of our thoughts about privacy, in terms of children's authorship rights, of how they're engaging with copyrighted materials for remix uh, types of projects. Um, and these discussions are kind of sporadically emerging in all these different formats. And we really want to create a place where we could talk about these things with the different people who are actually involved and get a broader view of the phenomenon, of the implications, and what we might be able to devise in terms of best practices and, and regulatory support systems. Um, one of the things that we were really surprised by was that there was a lot of research on kids' DIY media in little pockets that looked at anecdotal examples or specific platforms or formats, but there was really something lacking in terms of giving a broad view, like what are the actual practices across platforms, across different media types, how are kids learning and how are they jumping from one to the next, what types of support systems are in place, and how are designers making decisions when it comes to these tricky issues like privacy and censorship and copyright and, and how much... Uh, information to share and how much to allow kids to post and that type of thing. So we figured that the best way to do this was really to build a partnership that brought together the different people who were involved in these discussions or people who would like to be involved in these discussions. And that's the Kids DIY Media Project. So it's a cross-sector, cross-national partnership aimed at advancing our understanding of an important emerging phenomenon, children's increased participation in making and sharing digital media creations online. And it's a SHRC-funded project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. It's a three-year project with a possibility of becoming something more sustainable longer term uh, after the three-year development period is over. Um, really, we're aiming to map the various opportunities and challenges that are involved for kids' education, cultural rights, and creativity around this, this realm of practice. 
Uh, so far, we have a number of different amazing partners who've taken a chance on getting involved with us in these early years of developing the partnership, um, and I have them listed here. And uh, you know, it was really important to us to bring together people who are actually involved at the ground level in developing tools for kids, as well as educators and parents and different people who are involved in child advocacy, as well as kids themselves, to talk about their own experiences as creators, how they're engaging with these issues, if they're engaging with these issues and, and what they think about them. Our key, key objectives with the partnership, uh, in addition to creating something that's more sustainable and long term in terms of a group that can come together and deal with emerging issues relating to kids' digital media creation, is to identify the types of support systems, so regulatory, infrastructural, and technical, so design, um, required to foster a rights-based, child-centric, inclusive approach to children's online DIY media production, which will in turn support children's learning, cultural participation, and digital skill development. And within this, it kind of seems highfalutin to obviously want to develop academic understanding and kind of advance uh, academic knowledge. But more importantly for the project, and one of the reasons that we're working so closely with partners from the get-go uh, with this project, is that we want to produce things that will have tangible outcomes for the stakeholders who are actually involved in kids media um, production of tools for kids media and support. So this includes a best practices document, uh, we want to create a number of policy recommendations, as well as info sheets and activity pages for kids, educators and parents. And I'm going to hand it over to Debbie to talk about where we're at in the actual research that we're doing. So like Sarah mentioned, we are um <clears throat> and like Christoph introduced, we are just about at the end of our first year of really starting to get this project off the ground. And um, so I get to share some of the things that we're doing and some of the ways where we're going, but it's going to be very brief. Um, so hopefully it'll generate some questions and some discussion. We can talk about the topics that are of interest here. So one of our first year goals um, were to, one, review all the literature we could find on um, what are sort of the educational and communicative and identity and um, et cetera values of kids making and sharing things. Um, we also uh, indulged in a long search to find all sorts of websites where kids share stuff they make. Not a trivial sort of thing to do, actually, as it turned out. Um, started to analyze and compare those sites, and then we have, um, we're also, as we do that, studying all the terms and conditions, the privacy policies, all the legalism, all those different things that um, are built into each of those sites. So the theme of our year this year is sharing. So in education where I come from, there's a lot of talk right now about kids making things and creating things and the educational value you get when you make something yourself, right? You debug things, you work through problems, you maybe try it out with an audience, you know, maybe it's your parents or on your refrigerator or in your classroom or maybe it's online. But one of the things that um, is really not talked about a lot in certainly academic literature and, um, and sort of the implications of it aren't always that clear. What's the role of sharing in that making enterprise, right? And this is one of those particular great things that could happen online is you can share things that you make and have an audience, you can get feedback, all these sorts of things. But when we went to look at the literature, this was either really an implicit sort of thing, like, oh yeah, kids shared. And we're not really going to talk a lot about that. Um, is, or we just assume that it happens and it's good and there, we don't need to think about it. But um, one thing we've learned is not to take that for granted. Because when we look to look to find all these websites where kids share stuff they make. Now, I think a lot of us are familiar with some big ones like Minecraft and Scratch. And there's a lot of fan fiction writing sites. YouTube might be a site like this. Those sorts of things. But then there's a lot of smaller ones and a lot of emerging ones. Um, well, one thing first found is that there's a lot of sites that don't necessarily support um, making. There's a lot of come play our game, come play our virtual world, those sorts of things. So that just, you know, we're not looking at those. And the next part was um, we had to eliminate a lot of sites because there might have been making but no sharing. So maybe it was a content generation tool, but there was no way for kids to see what anyone else was making with that tool um, or to share what they had made. I mean, maybe you can make something and print it off, but that doesn't really count. So we wanted a, something that was shareable. And as we started analyzing those sites that we did include in our study, probably about 150 to 200 sites right now, um, we found that there are often really limited networking and sharing features. And it's been really fascinating to sort of 
begin comparing what the different features are on different sites. What does this mean for what kids can do and express, what kind of feedback they can get, um, and those sorts of things. And um, yeah, so that's one of the themes of this year. And then of course, with sharing comes a lot of these policy and privacy and copyright and all these interesting, challenging, um, messy issues. Um, when you share stuff, then what are kids' rights over that content? When you share, when kids are sharing stuff, um, what if they are drawing on someone else's media that they've created, right? Um, and how informed are they of their rights? And how informed are the designers of, in terms of creating things that are maybe readable and understandable by kids? These are some really tricky negotiations to have. So just a couple thoughts on sharing. As David already mentioned, we view sharing as an important part of the activity of creating things. You can create something, but until you share it with someone, um, you're, you're sort of missing a piece. Maybe it's just something you make for your own, but I know that even when I, for instance, I'm a knitter, when I knit, I get a lot out of sharing something that I've made or wearing it and people talking about it and those sorts of things. It helps people develop, children and adults. Um, as creators, they can get feedback. It can make the creative process more transparent. You can get ideas from each other. You get community support. Being part of an interest-driven community is huge in supporting these creative practices. Um, so it's really important that way. And then, of course, there's all sorts of barriers. I mean, one barrier, of course, is people are just mean sometimes, and kids are also just mean sometimes. And what do you do about mean kids? You say, that's ugly, or that's stupid, or I don't like it. Um, how do you help create a more constructive conversation? How do you moderate sites, especially for young children? How do you um, educate children about appropriate ways to behave online? And then, of course, the issues of ownership and um, even just the design space that allows for sharing um, and those privacy things. So as we have developed um, our scheme for comparing these 150 or so websites, um, these are some of the things we're looking at. One, how do children represent themselves, right? And is there a presence for children online? A lot of the spaces we're looking at don't necessarily, aren't necessarily designed for children. In fact, it's a pretty, um, gutsy area to go out and design a website that's mainly directed for children, and uh, Jason can talk about that. Um, so when they are there, are they there, how are they represented, and what kind of ways can they represent themselves, what kinds of designs are out there in terms of what the, the media that they can share, but also the, the designs of the website. What are the range and what can we, you know, as we start comparing those, we want to hopefully share some best practices or you know, multiple models for um, what might be productive in terms of kids sharing. Um, all the different models for managing and moderating. And then of course that issue of transparency again in terms of policy and legal issues. So I think I'm going to hand it off. That's, Debbie's just given the invitation that we need. J Jason, would you uh, tell us how you do manage that? <laughs> Jason is- uh, I don't uh, have that much time, David, but- No. Uh, maybe we'll get to that in the- in the in the Q and A, do I have to do anything to get the next slide up? Do we have Jason's presentation? It just takes a moment. Okay. I should have answered your question. <laughs> um, well, I'll start. Um, my name's Jason. Uh, I now run a studio called Sego Sego, and before that, I ran a studio called Zinc Row. Kind of the same studio. Um, uh, ever since I got into this space back, this is 14, 15 years ago, I've been fascinated by the idea of creating sort of curated experiences where kids and tools where kids can create content, share stories. Um, the very, very first project we ever did was a sort of collage building tool. Um, Shortly after, we built a storybook building tool with the CBC, where we enlisted storybook authors and illustrators to provide the content, and then invited the kids to rearrange, add, modify, and write the story. Um, we did that in a number of different ways. Could, you could write a whole story. You could take turns writing pages to the stories. We applied the same sort of idea in all sorts of different situations. Probably the biggest example is uh, uh, a website called the Zimmer Twins, which still exists today, where kids can go on, and they can write little one minute animated stories and we give them a library that's, that's quite vast of stuff that they can work with, um, but they, were, they provide all the dialogue. And, uh, and that's a fascinating little peek into the world of sort of uh, 
moderation and privacy policies and all the practicalities. And all the time, there's sort of like this sort of top level view of the value of all this stuff. But I'll tell you, when you actually go to implement this and you try to get people to pay for it and you try to worry about the lawyers and everybody else, it, it gets pretty messy pretty quickly. So I think, uh, I think I got invited to the room basically to speak to those kind of messy, messy points. Um, I thought I'd just use my brief time to just share what I'm working on right now, which is uh, apps for uh, quite young children. Um, at Sego Sego, we create apps for uh, kids sort of two to five. Here they are. Um, so we started this project about a year ago. We've since launched eight apps, and uh, and they've done very well. So we're we're coming in at almost four million downloads. On any given day, somewhere between 100 and 150,000 kids interact with one of our apps, um, which, is, which is very satisfying and fun. Um, and a number of them have a sort of a DIY component to them. I'll, in, in the past, like the Zimmer Twins really was an audience of sort of 10, 12, 13 year olds. Um, and inherent to doing web-based projects was there sort of a certain age barrier. Um, when it comes to touchscreen devices, we can go a lot younger, and it gets quite fascinating. Um, probably the best example of this, a sort of content creation at a very young age, is uh, an app called DoodleCast. Um, and instead of trying to explain it, I was going to show you a, a video. I will draw a train. I'm drawing a train. I will do the S and the T and the 1 and 2 and 3 and the 4 and 5 and 6. Now there's the 6. What's your favorite food? Hot dog. A strawberry. A pancake. I like it with parmigiano. Now I'm going to draw a bee. It's very buzzy. Can you put a candle on the birthday cake? Yes. Okay. Let's draw the people. Purple, yellow, and pink. Happy. Birthday. Two. And Michelle. To Aunt Michelle. And then you should do like little black dots because like you know you were wearing at the party yesterday. Done? What is Ella's favorite color? Purple, yellow, and pink. Look. Look. Okay, let's do blue. Baby blue, too. I like baby. That's the fun part. <laughs> yeah. Say, I'm Michelle. Send. We did it. So this is a, this is a friend, um, and he's showing off a bug that he's made with one of our apps called Bug Builder. Um, and it, this I really like this photo because for me it sums up a lot of the sort of basic qualities that we try to build into our, our products. And, and namely, you know, the top two are really relevant to this discussion of sort of mastery and ownership. Um, that we are trying to create tools that are, w you know, within reach of that, that, that crucial mastery, you know, feeling that is so crucial for young kids, that they can do this on their own and that they feel like the final product, whether it's the experience or whether there's an actual tangible outcome of it, they have a sense of ownership uh, over that. Um, and those are all very intertwined. Um, we're often looking for that moment where the kid picks up the iPad and just is like, Mom, Dad, you've got to see this. Um, and uh, and that, that sort of speaks to the sort of the, the power of, of, of tapping into um, the creation. Um, Bug Builder, um, and we have another most recent app, it's called Monsters. Um, they're, they're kind of used similar principles. They're basically, we have a set of, we have a sort of, it's part tool and it's part kind of curated creation. So you have, you know, a, we have all this artwork that they work with, and then we allow them or invite them to just mess with it. So we kind of remix it and, and play with it uh, and, and mess it up. Um, and then we hope that they share all this stuff. 
And yes, it raises all sorts of questions about ownership and are these monsters ours? Are they belong to the kids or neither or both? Um, it raises questions about, to some extent, privacy. Conceivably, you could write your address on some monster face. I don't know. Um, but but those, are, those are the kind of questions that come up over and over again on these, uh, these sorts of projects. A lot of my attention is more on the, the sort of how do you build tools that are just enough kind of scaffolding to make them uh, really approachable for young kids, enough sort of creative input, but then allow them to kind of have their have their part to it. Um, Brian, while you, while you go on up, let me just say that I've had the pleasure of participating as a judge in something that Brian works with, which is the uh, uh, STEM game building challenge, where young people build games around science, technology, engineering, and math. And it's such a fascinating thing to see the thinking that goes into it on multiple levels, the way kids not only approach the design of the game, but then also incorporate the content, the, the science content into it. Um, to me, it, it's, it's the kind of deep thinking that we really need in, in learning right now. So, Brian, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, David. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear so many of the of the same re recurring themes uh, come up. So I work for a company called uh, Eline Media. We are a, a publisher of game-based learning products and, and services. We started the company about five years ago, and we're interested in doing innovative stuff with, with game-based learning. And we quickly ended up on the theme of, uh, I think like, like all of our panelists today, um, youth media creation as a pathway to kids building really interesting and tremendously valuable skills across a whole range of, of, of subject areas and, and, and life skills. Um, and so that's been a central theme of what our, what our company has been, been working on. The project I spend most of my time on is, is the one you see on the screen here, which is a, a project called GameStar Mechanic. GameStar grew out of academic research at the uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, NYU, and the Institute of Play uh, in New York City. And the concept was very simple. It was, could you create a game that taught kids how to design and make video games? And uh, in along with that, build critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, a motivation for design and engineering, systems-based thinking skills. The product is geared at middle school uh, age kids predominantly. The sweet spot is kind of about nine to 14 year olds. And it's really um, the first experience we would hope kids would have on an engineering technology pathway. What's interesting is when the, uh, the researchers were first doing the learning design and the pedagogy uh, behind GameStar, they learned that um, you needed three components kind of all working together to make the content, uh, this concept of youth media creation work, and not surprisingly, they're the, they're the ones that, that, that we've discussed. You needed a tool to teach kids um, and introduce the concepts of something like game design. You needed a tool where kids could actually design and make games. But what was interesting was when they just had those two components, they found they weren't getting the learning outcomes that they wanted to. When they added the third component, which was a community where kids could share, interact, get feedback from other kids, iterate on their designs, that's kind of when the magic happened and they started seeing those kind of outcomes. And so as we've taken over the, the, the project and made the transition from a uh, an academic research project to a commercial product now that's available in uh, in uh, you know for use in schools or by kids at home. Um, we've tried to preserve that and and extend it um, so that all um, those components exist. They work together, um, and we you know find ways to address many of the the same challenges that the other the other panelists have have talked about with a little bit of an older uh, audience in this case. So. I thought I would give you guys a, a quick look at how we approach that in GameStar, if I can enter my password properly. There we go. So I, I mentioned those three components. Um, the first is something we call the quest, which is an adventure game story where you go through and you're learning the principle of game design as you progress through this adventure story. You're also earning the tools you'll be able to make when you design your own games as you do that. And so in this way, whether it's teaching a kid how to use a particular game design concept, like 
balancing the gravity settings in a platformer game, or whether we're introducing an issue that, that frequently comes up like dealing with intellectual property and how do you remix or uh, attribute something to another, uh, another kid that's uh, inspired you. Um, we have an opportunity to introduce that in a very scaffolded way and have, give kids a chance to demonstrate mastery before they unlock a tool and are able to go uh, willy-nilly with it. You then have a creation tool inside the platform in your workshop where you can actually uh, make a game of your own. But crucially, when you've made a game that you like um, and you think is cool and you're ready to share with the community, you can publish it to an online community inside the platform that we call Game Alley, which is, I, I would say, conceptually similar to a YouTube-like community, but very... Uh, constrained around the concept of working with others and working with your peers to iterate on and improve your game design. So when you publish a game, and we'll look at um, one that I made, um, your game gets its own page in Game Alley. Any other member of the community um, can play it, and those users who've been through an introductory quest about how to give effective feedback and earn the privilege to do that can leave you feedback on your game. And they can do that... Um, in the form of uh, things like very simple ratings, so they can give it an overall star rating, they can evaluate how difficult it, uh, the game is, and then they can leave structured feedback in a rubric that we provide where they can give overall feedback, they can talk about the gameplay, the story, the visuals specifically, and all of this is exposed back to the designer. Um, and he can use that to iterate on and improve his design in response to what the community uh, is saying. We also collect, as you play through, qualitative data, apart, pardon me, quantitative data um, about your game. And we expose that again back to the designer. So not only do you see what folks are um, saying about your game qualitatively, but you can actually see how things play out when they actually play your game. So for example, real quickly, I'll bring up the game stats uh, for that same game I just I just showed you, which is uh, my attempt at an action-oriented puzzler game. Because um, a kid challenged me and said, you couldn't make a puzzle game in GameStar. And so I felt compelled to respond. Um, this is a very simple visualization we show to, to kids. Um, it was actually one that we use as, as, as game designers. Some of you have probably seen something like this if you've played around with Google Analytics on, uh, on a website. This is a funnel visualization, and what this says is each one of these slices represents a different level of my seven-level game. And the top of the funnel represents how many players started that level and how many players finished that level is the bottom of, of that slice. And so you can very easily see what the, the progression of players through your game is. And we give kids some tools so they can understand what this means, right? What does it mean if your funnel is a straight pipe? Well, it, it could mean that every level, the, that the game is really, really easy, and so everyone who starts every level finishes every level. Or it could mean that uh, you've made an exciting game, and it's so cool that they want to play through it, you know, and beat each level, uh, even though it may take them a couple of tries. And we can expose that in the qualitative and the quantitative feedback um, as well. Um, we deal with kids who are unkind, not, surpri not surprisingly, and that's why we, we moderate the community. But I would say the, the most significant thing that we've learned um, is that in addition to providing the tools, you have to set sort of the cultural norms of the, of the community. And because we very heavily reinforce in the tone of the site, in the way our moderators approach things, it's a place about game design. And so constructive feedback about your game even if you're pointing out that something that a designer could have done better is totally in scope, but you know a hurtful remark for no purpose obviously is out of scope. And we find that by reinforcing that, kids start to reinforce it um, too, and it's certainly not 100% of the time, but um, we get kids who will, who will make that remark about someone else's feedback, and they'll say, well, that's, don't just say that this game stinks. Say, you know, say what could be better about it. Good, thank you. Um, one of the things that in intrigues me about this is it seems to me there are multiple motivations for creating and for sharing. And I'm interested in both in what the research has found and also in, in what you found through practical projects about why people approach uh, wanting to create and share. And when they do that, you know, for example, what we've just seen with, with GameStar, um, 
you can share for reasons where you're really eager to get that feedback, and you can share because you just made this and you want to get it out there. I'm curious if the research has found anything so far about different motivations to share. We, you know, one thing I, I've read often lately about kids who think they want to be famous, they want to get lots of hits, generation like, the frontline program. Anything from the research first? Um, well, the research is multifaceted, as, as it usually is, right? <laughs> um, but uh, what it shows is that there are various different motivations. And uh, one of the things that we were really interested in was actually looking at this from a perspective that was inclusive of different types of motivations, as well as different types of making, right? So um, one of the big uh, challenges we had was what do we include as media making? What do we count as media making? And not just websites, that's just step one. There are other, other places too. Um, but what what kids get out of it and what kind of what their experience is. Uh, the previous research is really, it depends on what the discipline is and what they've asked kids about oftentimes. Um, and, but even within one forum, like a Scratch or a GameStar mechanic, you probably have archetypes of the different types of kids that engage for these different reasons. And the really interesting thing that uh, the emerging longitudinal research shows is that a same kid can go through different motivations over the course of their interaction with a particular tool or as they jump from one tool, tool to the next or if they're having a good day or a bad day, you know, it, it completely depends. So it's keeping that open mind about it is, is part of the challenge because how do you support multiple multiple reasons and multiple multiple ways and, and do you find that in the creation of it do you, are there kids who create games and just put them up there and leave them behind and never look again and kids who really want to engage in a give and take it, it's precisely what we see you know play out in a community like GameStar there 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 are various motivations and kids shift between them um, as you know sometimes as their moods shift, but sometimes as they as they engage more deeply. A significant motivation in something like GameStar for kids is to get a lot of plays on their game. To get, you know, um, I didn't show you the top page of, of that game, Alley, but there are various sections your game can end up in, you know, highest rated games or featured games where our community moderators find something and, and, and pop it up there. Um, and so that's a significant motivation for, for a lot of kids um, as well. But as kids get more, um, deeply engaged for those kids who really, really dig it. Um, it becomes more and more about the feedback and, and kids actually want to get it. And they, and they tend to, as that happens, be more appreciative of good feedback and will, will comp, you know, compliment the, the person who left it or go and become a follower of the person who, who left them good feedback or, or will, will pair off and enter a little you know, collaboration and giving feedback to another kid. Um, and they tend to react negatively to kids who leave, <laughs> who leave un, unhelpful or unkind feedback. And I'm guessing, Jason, that, that there's less of concern about the motivation. I mean, kids at the age you're working with are natural creators. And well, yeah, a lot of it is actually just a, an acknowledgement of their mastery of a skill or something that they, their mark, you know? And so it's as simple as sharing that often with, you know, mom and dad. And, but there's, there's, a, there's also a sharing component which is specifically motivated by the parents which has nothing to do with the kids, and, uh, which, is, which is you have to be aware of too. So a lot of, for a lot of parents, they'll share it with their social circle or other, and, or, 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 or wherever, but they have different motivations completely. And how do you build that into the, the scaffolding for it so that kid can share with parents and parents make the decision of how widely to share it from there? Um, the practicalities are, are, are a little bit tricky, but we, in the case of the apps that we do, we just make it rel relatively easy to get the content onto the uh, device's camera roll, and then we stay steer clear. Um, we actually used to have uh, abilities to link accounts to YouTube or Dropbox or various services like that, and it just uh, got too problematic with COPA, um, so it was all taken out. Um, when it comes to, so you've got these really conflicting forces of uh, voices saying that we want it to be easier to share and voices saying, yeah, but that could be bad. So you have to figure that out. Now with the, the Zimmer Twins was an older group and we saw also like the full range of motivations and it was fascinating to see the diversity there. The kids who just would make stuff and never look at anybody else's to those who became like heroes within the community and who became mentors, and some of them, I, I'm pretty sure, are in their 20s, who are like continuing to go back to the site to like give feedback and, and suggestions and uh, even coach uh, new members on the culture of the site, which is fascinating. And I'm curious in, um, about the role of adults, whether teachers or 
parents in, in this case. I mentioned at the beginning that you want to create an opportunity for the adult to be a good play partner, to be a good supportive uh, uh, guided play, you know, to guide what they're doing, but without stepping on the kid's creativity. Are there best practices, if there are content creators here who are thinking about in, adding in a, um, a creation aspect, are there best practices? That um. Well, there's a lot. One of the things we found is that um, you know the kids who tend to post the most stuff online, in particular, I, one of the websites I study is Scratch, which is a lot of programming projects, is that those are the kids who have the most resources at home. They have family or teachers or friends who are encouraging them to go on. And so it becomes a more connected community for them. So it's not like just the website, right? There's these real life connections that really support that. In terms of um, one of the big challenges, I think, in helping kids create stuff is, is helping them develop the skills to do it and the confidence to share it while then also leaving room for that creativity. So we found a lot of success with like an art studio model, right? Where you give like a, a challenge and um, and you can imagine like websites or, or apps, you know, saying, hey, make something that does this. But it's a very open-ended challenge. So it might help them learn particular skills um, and then move on from those. You were talking before we came up here about it, one that had a framework to it where the kids didn't realize really there was a framework to it. They thought they were op operating in a free environment and, the, and yeah. only figured out later. Yeah, I, I do. So some of my work involves like uh, virtual creations, like with Scratch, and some with um, more physical things, like sewing with conductive thread to make your clothes light up and those sorts of things. And um, with that, we'll tell kids, okay, you have to make a project that has four lights and this little microcontroller and two patches so that when you squeeze the patches, the lights blink in different patterns. But we're not going to tell you where those lights have to be or where the patches are going to be or what the shapes they are in or what this whole backdrop is. And maybe it's on a hoodie, maybe it's on a monster that you squeeze. And so the kids feel like they've been immensely creative. They're learning certain skills that give them the abilities to move further in that creative medium and uh, find it very works and borrow that from really art teachers. Brian, how, how do you support in, in a situation like the, the STEM competition? How do you support the educators to, to be good mentors without uh, guiding too much? I, I think the biggest thing we find with educators is for a lot of educators, and, and for the kids especially when you're dealing with kids who are now a little older at the middle school age, is it's a big context shift. And it's one of the reasons we, we focused in on game design. Game design is such an inherently iterative process. It's like the antithesis of you do, you know, you complete a school assignment, you hand it in, you get a letter grade on the top and you're done, right? No one ever, you know, it doesn't matter how good a game designer you are, the first time you prototype something or the first time you do something, it isn't right, it is, doesn't resemble what the final product is going to be, and you're going to iterate on that. And so we carved out game design specifically and try to reinforce both with the kids in the community, but when we do professional development and in our learning materials, working with teachers and saying, this is an iterative process. Here's how to be a, an effective facilitator of kids providing good constructive feedback to each other and then the, the kids as designers assimilating that feedback and iterating based on it. Um, you, and the beauty is that if you can be an effective facilitator of that as a teacher without yourself being a gamer or an expert on gaming, because the kids know it, the kids, the, the kids have the game design knowledge already. We do some other things like, like we do in the STEM challenge where we get uh, mentors from the game industry and we have neat ways of connecting them with kids and teachers. But the, the role that the teacher can really play and excel at is even if you don't have the content expertise, the facilitation of good giving and receiving of feedback. Jason, you look like you wanted to. Yeah, I just had one point, which is the, I think the biggest challenge as adults is stepping away. Um, and I think that you got a lot of smart people in a room and you're trying to figure out how do we get them to learn this and how do we you know, get them to, to, to do this and do this. But there's rarely a voice in the room which is like, you know, the more you do that, the, 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 the more you're going to harm the engagement, the, the less ownership the kids are going to have over the whole process. So I, I, I think you have to have somebody in that room who who can speak for that point and just say less is more like let's let's not try to shape the tool all around a set of learning objectives let's provide support for the the teachers educators parents in all sorts of other channels and that that's definitely the best way to go i it's it, it's i i really echo 
echo that sentiment of, 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 of stepping back and finding ways to, to, to facilitate or encourage without overwhelming. You know, to use your, uh, your analogy, I think at the, the start of the session, David, I imagine probably the f immediately after that first kid picked up the charcoal in the cave, probably the, an adult probably walked up and said, you're doing it wrong. Um, and I think we have to find the way to do the opposite of that. <laughs> Good. I want to pose one more question up here, and then if you have questions, I'm going to be looking out to, to get you involved as well. So let me just ask, Sarah, I know it's a, a multidimensional study, but is there one sort of core piece of, that's missing right now of the research? Is there a, a, we must start here by finding this out and all the rest will grow from it? Or? I mean, where we've started is kind of, as Debbie outlined, with this idea of the, the lack of enough emphasis on sharing. So providing, I mean, providing developers with the research to back up this idea that it's important, um, as well as connecting it more firmly to the different kind of benefits that, that would derive from sharing. So there's educational benefits, but there's all these other facets to it, right? And there's, there's cultural aspects and, and just sense of well-being and sense of participation, and there's civic engagement aspects. So there's kind of making those connections a little bit more clear so that those people who are involved in, in this, this realm have a vocabulary and have like a resource kit to draw on when they're trying to justify it. Because like what comes up and kind of what um, Jason was mentioning earlier, you hit this messy place of privacy requ uh, policy requirements and legal requirements and it's hard to really push back against a lot of the assumptions that are made. And those assumptions really are that kids are users. They're, they're not, they, those, a lot of those things weren't built or designed or articulated, and you mentioned the Convention of the Rights of the Child, they weren't, they weren't thinking of kids as producers. And so if we keep kind of using those as the guidelines and, and kind of don't have any way to push back or engage, that, that f I think that's the most urgent. Uh, at least that's for me. How, how about you, Debbie? Children. Children. Would, uh, I imagine you come up against one of the issues right now that, that the education world is going back toward more testing, more structure, more, you know, and, and if you present kids as makers, if you present kids as, as um, you know, we're trying to empower kids' creativity, you're going to run up against that, that, yeah, but does it help them on the test? The problem there is we don't do that with teachers. <laughs> you know, so start there. That's very true. There's so much research that shows that the way you teach people how to teach is how they're going to teach. So you can look at teacher education programs, and if people are saying, okay, you need to do these 20 things, blah, 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 then that's how they teach their children. Teach Even them. if you're telling them to do it in a different way, you have to model it and engage people. So some of the projects I've been involved with engage teachers in making things themselves, realizing it is an iterative process, and you go, oh, hey, look how they're iterating on their game. How could that be useful in an English class? Who struggles with getting their children to revise their papers? Right? <laughs> so to develop these sorts of practices. Among the teachers themselves. Uh, yeah. 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 So you understand. Questions from here? Yeah. Hi. Oh, my Hi. Um, I have lots of questions. This is an awesome, uh, I love it. Um, so for the gentleman from E-Line, e what is the, uh, I'd love to know the penetration of GameStar in schools, A. B, what's the relationship, uh, the ratio between the kids that are playing, the kids that are publishing, and the kids that are critiquing, like, what is that? So um, we, we launched the product for back to school, uh, the 2010-2011 school year. Mm. Um, we're in uh, over 6,000 classrooms at this point, and over 600,000 kids have used the, the platform. Uh, for the kids, and, and, I, and I should mention too, we make it available both for classroom use, and as a kid, you can just go and use it and, and, and sign up online. Um, so we see very similar usage patterns among kids who use it in classrooms and, and outside of classrooms. Um, for the kids who sort of um, make it through the initial onboarding of, of, the, of the experience and show some commitment to, to learning game design, um, almost 80% of kids will attempt making a game. And over 50% will actually publish something to the community. And almost every kid who does publish something to the community leaves some sort of feedback on another kid's game, even if it's just that simple uh, you know, a rating, a quality and difficulty rating. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. And I'm wondering um, from the gentleman from Sago Sago, 
Jason. Uh, um, are you interested in uh, taking your content into other media? Or are you just... Uh, we're interested, um, but I think in a very kind of, at the, in a long view sort of way. Um, so we, we were founded on the principle that was sort of like the, the anti-trans media company, yep. um, where we were like, we want to make digital play, we want to make it amazing, and so we just want to focus on that. Mm -hmm. um, I think that we're, we and our sister studio, Toka Boca, are obviously kind of getting to a point when uh, we have a large audience and things, we, we're sort of hitting our stride with that, and so then the question always comes up about taking it to other media. Yeah, well, it's a fierce brand. I mean, Toka Boca is amazing. It's like, it, man, you yeah. did eight apps this year? Yeah. Is that what you said? And so is that your projection for next year, too? Like, are you just on that yeah, track? Yeah, that was a little intense. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot so, to do very, very quickly. Yeah. Seven so, in a long weekend this year. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, but we're, we're actually aiming for seven this year. Oh, that's great. Other questions from the audience? Let me ask, we talked, we've talked a little bit about safety, and we obviously need things like COPPA to, I mean, there are, there are real issues, there are real dangers out there, but can you see us a best way of evolving forward so that we've got rules that protect kids but also allow creative expression? It seems like, like what we've got right now really kind of constricts people in ways that, that we're losing a lot of the, the opportunity. I mean, this is really one of the questions that uh, I've felt most passionate about in this project. Um, and I don't think it's one that academics could ever answer alone, no matter how much we studied it. Um, and it's one of the primary reasons for me of, of, you know, kind of wanting, I mean, initially, now there's a number of questions that I'm fascinated by, but it was this type of exact question, because it's not that I'm anti-regulation, far from it. There needs to be safety. There, children need to be protected against having their data exploited, you know, and, and their privacy infringed upon. And all of these things are real. It's just achieving a better balance. And I think that it has to do with who's, who's at the table when these discussions are taking place. And until now, they've kind of occurred in this really disconnected way. And it's kind of ironic that we're talking about COPPA because we're in Canada and it's not <laughs> our policy, and yet we're all very subject to it. So th those exact types of decisions being made by people who aren't necessarily the ones who are working with kids or making things for kids in, in these really hands-on kinds of ways. Um, how, do we, how do we move forward? How can we achieve a better balance? How do we help developers who are already trying to achieve that balance by devising like super innovative you know, in-house rules about moderation and, and those types of things? It's precisely what we're looking for and, and at. So it sounds like it's really a mix of, of policy possibilities, but also creating more robust tools and also creating stronger media literacy. It's really going to have to be a hand-in-hand -in -hand kind of, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And personally, I think um, the opportunity really lies in, in working with developers and, and working with media literacy campaigns. I mean, I, I always hope that policy recommendations will be listened to, but <laughs> that's a big machine to that's try big. to intervene in. Well, and even within the context of policy, we also then need to get parents to pay attention. That even if yeah. you create really good guidance for parents, you know, we've, we've got proof often, I think, going back to the V-chip and probably before, that parents will say they want something until they have it, and then getting them to use it is the next, the next step. Mm. I think we have a question over here. Yes. Hi there. Um, I'm really interested in the conversation about sharing and what comes to mind for me, one area that I'm interested in, is can we apply and how can we apply the same um, idea to uh, youth produced sexual media? So youth exploring uh, their sexuality, uh, of course this becomes a, a, loaded, a loaded topic. I'm wondering if that has come up in, as part of your research and whether you know, anyone would like to comment on that as a particular form of sharing that becomes quite problematized. Um, this connects really well to uh, our, our concern about children's communicative rights not being weighed heavily enough uh, because the kind of default, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to generalize because we're always looking for the exceptions and the people who are tackling these issues in different ways. But, you know, the kind of trend has been to just avoid anything that might be controversial. And, you know, you can see why. Um, but if that shuts off whole 
avenues of discussion, talking about sexuality, talking about abuse, you know, talking about dark thoughts, or, or trying to explore themes that aren't associated with this ideal, very romantic idea that we have of, of childhood as, as just pure happiness and learning and fun. Um, then what are we what are we really providing kids? You know, media and self-expression needs to include these things. It's there's no good guideline. There are sites that are trying to let that happen, and they have to come up with their own their own litmus test of, of how far they'll let it go. And they have to also deal with having you know people kind of attack them and, and controversies around them. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of the things that hasn't been talked about enough, definitely. I think it's one of those issues that also brings up um, layers, right, of sharing and creating safe communities where those things are okay to share. So there, there's some great research by people who um, work with kids and creating um, dramas and videos and those sorts of things that help them explore their identities and and share those. And I mean, one thing that that I was thinking of in an earlier in this hour was, um, and that this sort of brought up for me, is that oh, there's like massive website sharing. There's, you can create smaller communities within that. You can also use some of these ideas, right, on the role of sharing just to help work in a classroom or a small group, right? Sometimes that's where sharing helps and just getting feedback from other people on how you're expressing yourself or support and those sorts of things helps in those areas too. So we can learn backwards and forwards from these conversations, not just about, oh, yay, massive websites and apps and those sorts of things, but also about more localized um, and tangible kinds of creation, too. We're pretty much out of time, but I don't, I don't want to let the opportunity go without giving um, Sarah and Debbie a chance to, to say, are there ways that people can be involved? How would you like people to connect up with you and, and contribute to the, the ongoing work? Yes. Well, uh, as I mentioned, we're currently in a development phase. So the next three years, we're developing a partnership, but we want to work towards something that's longer term, more sustainable, and includes a wider diversity of voices. So people from different industry sectors, people who are engaged in different forms of child advocacy, uh, children who are engaged in making, parents and teachers who are interested in supporting it. Um, and, you know, Re really participation doesn't require that much. Uh, we're looking for people to contribute thoughts and opinions. Um, you can keep up with the project on our website and download reports. We're making everything available freely. And we'll be kind of developing uh, ways of getting involved at, in different, to different extents, in formal, formal ways and informal ways as we move forward. And we have a more intimate workshop in two days. We do, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Please join me in thanking Jason and Debbie and Brian and Sarah and get involved. Thank you, David.